Well, good morning, life, church, life, Christian church. It's good to be together again. If you are watching uh, online right now, we have just begun uh, our in-person services again. We are socially distancing ourselves, uh, but we really, really, really are doing, uh, uh, I mean, it's not easy to not just want to hug everybody because we haven't seen each other for so long, uh, and uh, it's just good to be together today. But uh, you know what? We're going to have a great time in the Word, and I want to invite each and every one of us just to take a moment and let's let God have his way. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I get the privilege of bringing the final episode in a series that Pastor Josh has been teaching. It's called The Sting. And it began in the book of Genesis, and it all started with a man by the name of Adam. Adam made a big mistake. Now, you think for some of you men, you might want me to include Eve in there, but I'm not going to do that because we men who've been married a long time understand that we have to take full responsibility if we want to stay married. So we're just going to talk about what Adam did momentarily. Adam made a big mistake in the Garden of Eden, and that caused this dr dramatic and eternally significant separation between God and man. Jesus, Jesus came to change all that. And we've been learning over the course of the last three Sundays that sting that originally the devil thought he had permanently inflicted upon humanity, Jesus came and removed the stinger. Amen to that. And today I get to bring the message, uh, it's the sting, part four, final score. Now, I do want to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. I don't know if you go on to Google News and stuff like that, but I'm always amazed. I'll just jump on there and something that I've been watching on Netflix and boom, there's a spoiler alert. But you know what? They say spoiler alert, but before you stop reading, you already see what they are going to spoil. So I'm going to let you know right now, the spoiler alert is in the end, we win. As a matter of fact, we won. It's over. Game over. Now, here's what happens. The devil spends all of the time he has had since Jesus died on the cross. He has spent all this time, 2,000 plus years, and he's going to continue to spend all the, re or the rest of his time until he's locked up and forever locked away. He's going to spend that trying to convince you and me that the game isn't over. Are you listening? He's going to use tools in his toolbox to try to convince us that we aren't the winners. And that affects the way that we live our lives. Last week, Pastor Josh gave us three commands right at the end, three, three uh, very important challenges. Number one was do not be afraid. What was number two? Do not be afraid. How about number three? Do not be afraid. In fact, the most repeated command in all of Scripture, it's not thou shalt not, it's fear not, which really reveals to you and I what it is that we're really facing on a day-to-day -day basis. It is the subject of fear. It might be fear of catching COVID. Right now, we have begun, well, we have been We've implemented a lot of precautions to try to keep us from getting a disease that some people have, have died from. Many people have died from, too many people. But you know what? We might, we might be afraid of that. And so we, we hunker down, and it's important for us to follow some of the, some of the CDC guidelines that we have, some of the, so the natural, I mean, just kind of just use your head. Let's, let's be wise. Let's think of each other and all that stuff. But fear comes, and it can be a fear of rejection. Maybe it's a fear of flying. Maybe you have a fear of disease or pain or death. The devil doesn't care how he uses fear. He just wants you to buy in. If we can buy into his bill of goods, his bag of fear, he will keep us from being the, the people that God made us to be. 
the productive people he made us to be. Now, it's important for us to kind of put something out there because if you read in the Bible, it does say something, well, it says it many times, it says, fear God. Well, that has nothing to do with the kind of fear that the devil uses against us. Fearing God basically is respect and it's reverence. It's not trepidation. It's not terror. Fear and the devil and death always go hand in hand. Don't forget, it's so easy to figure out if something is of God or something is not of God. Here's, here it is. John 10.10. 10. The thief, that's the devil, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and that more abundantly. It's so simple to look at a situation and go, well, how come planes flew into those buildings and so many people died? Well, I can tell you it wasn't God. Come on. Really? There's, there's things that happen in life, and the first thing that we want to do is that we want to either blame God, and then we get afraid of, you see the point here, is the devil wants us to blame God, so we'll be afraid of him and not come to him. When in fact, that's the time that we should run to the cross, run to the throne, run to Jesus. Head to the, to the place that where you can just kind of close out the world and meet Jesus face to face. You know, when you and I stop for a moment and recognize who is behind something, it really makes a difference because it changes the entire narrative on the situation. It, it helps us to kind of approach it and kind of remove the, the fear factor, if you might say it that way, the fear factor uh, of the situation. Let's, let's, uh, let's think about this situation. What Halloween is coming up in a little over a month. How many have ever been to a haunted house at Halloween time? And, and then we go to pay, we pay money to get our, our, <laughs> our screams out. But so would that be the same experience if you went to a haunted house during Halloween and it was daytime and the lights were all on? Would it be the same? Absolutely not, because you could see who's hiding around the corner. You could see it's paint and it's not blood. You see, God arms us. He arms us with faith, and faith turns the light on of what the devil's been trying to do in the dark. We walk by faith and not by sight. So it doesn't matter how dark it is. If we're walking by faith, the light is on in our heart. Jesus turns that light on and, and faith counteracts or completely exposes what the devil's been trying to do with fear. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31b. It says this, and this is such a powerful scripture. It says, if God is for us, if God is for us, who can ever be against us. Think about that. Don't just breeze through this, but think about it. Whenever you're facing a challenge in life, you're facing something that is just rocking your world, that's the time to stop and say, wait one moment. If God is for me, who can be against me? Now, that does not necessarily make the thing go away right then and there. As a matter of fact, we've got to get this figured out right now. Stuff happens. It's going to continue to happen. Why? Because we live in a world that is fallen. That's what the Bible says. The whole world, the system of the world, is already fallen and collapsed. That is where the devil is reigning in, in, in running rampant, is the world system. So here we are. We've been transformed. Those of us that have said yes to Jesus, we've been transformed into these beacons of light. And light and faith leads us through this challenging place that we still live. So we're still surrounded by the pain and the hardship and the heartbreak. But if God is for us, we win. It's that simple. 
John 16, 33, Jesus says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Now, wait, where do we find peace? In Jesus. How do we find peace in Jesus? What does that even mean? Where is Jesus that I can climb into his skin and have peace? Well, we walk by faith and not by sight. How do you fall in love? What does that mean? I fell in love with Tony Chambliss when I was 18 years old, and I'm still in love with her. 44 years later, what does that mean? It means that she lives in here. <laughs> it means that our lives are, are together, and wherever I am, she is, and wherever she is, I am. And maybe she doesn't like that very much, but you know what? <laughs> Tough. <laughs> she said, I do. <laughs> Come on, I'm just having some fun. We're in Christ with our thoughts, with, with the passion of our heart, with the reminder on a daily basis, as we go into God's Word, it reminds us, wow, God is for me. Wow, Jesus did this for me, and I do this, and I walk by faith, and the devil is defeated. And we remind ourselves, and that's how we refresh that revelation that we are in Christ. John 16, goes on to say, here on earth you will have many trials, and sorrows. Now, I know you don't want to listen and hear that. I don't like hearing that either, but it's true. It says, but take heart because I've overcome the world. Now, just a short time after Jesus spoke those words, he did that very thing. Now, remember this. Jesus became 100% man. He was God, but he became 100% man he was tempted in all points as we're tempted, yet without sin. And then he was accused of something that wasn't true. And they hung him on a cross, but he took our place. And the moment he did that, what happened? The temple, the temple curtain was rent. And the, the, the separation between the, the commoner and the holy of holies was rent into, and we had access to the presence of God. Jesus won. It's something that we need to remember every day. Whenever we're facing fear and, and, and calamity and sickness and, and lack and, and whatever, whatever comes at us, we need to remember that. Our access to the Father is unhindered because Jesus paved the way. Jesus has taken the sting out of sin and death by removing the venom of eternal separation. So, yes, death still happens. And guess what? It doesn't feel nice most of the time. I haven't been there yet, physically speaking, but you know what? Unless Jesus surprises us and comes in the clouds and we hear him call us and we are taken up into the clouds to meet him in the air like the Bible says will happen one day, unless that happens, we're all going to walk through that door of death. And some of us will be on morphine and we won't feel it. The some of us we won't be on morphine. I personally choose morphine. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're beginning to know the deep, dark secrets of my life. Every time I go to Smith's Pharmacy and I walk up there and to get my prescriptions, I say, do you have my morphine tabs yet? Um, <laughs> You know, <laughs> we both have had open heart surgery, Brother Frank, so we know, we, we know morphine intimately. Um, interestingly enough, 
You know, we can go through life doing our best to live our lives honorably, pleasing God, and hoping that doing so will alleviate some of that sting, some of that pain and suffering in life. But let me tell you what, sometimes it has the opposite effect. You want to live your life for God, the devil will challenge you. He will come along and he will challenge you to see, do you really believe that? Are you really willing to walk this path? There was an apostle by the name of John who was preaching the gospel, the good news, and doing so because God had led him to do that. And because he did that, the authorities exiled him to an island. If the authorities ever exile me to an island, I choose the big island. But that's not where John went. John went to Patmos. And what did John do when he got to the island of Patmos? Anybody? He wrote a book. He wrote a book because God gave him a revelation. You know, if you've read the book of Revelation, it's at the back of your Bible, and it's it's a book that was not intended to be entirely understood. As a matter of fact, it begins by saying, he who reads this book will be blessed. It doesn't say anything about understanding it. So don't worry about the interpretation. There are many, many interpretations of the book of Revelation. But today I want to glean just a couple things out of a part of the Revelation that John got. But let me tell you a little bit about the book of Revelation. Revelation actually comes from the, or it means apocalypse. So when you're reading Revelation, you're reading about the apocalypse. And Hollywood loves to make movies, and video, video, video gamers like to make, you know, video games that really kind of revolve around the whole premise of the book of Revelation. It's pretty thrilling. It's a uh, it is, uh, it's something that we just don't understand. Revelation paints a picture of the final tribulation that humanity will face. It's often cloaked in mystery and symbolism, but it, pro it portrays Christ's future triumph. Now, we know he's already triumphed over death, hell, and the grave, but it portrays his future triumph over the forces of evil and his recreation of the world for you and I for the redeemed. Uh, ultimately, the book and the world end in a final victory for truth and goodness and beauty. That was from Pastor Chuck Swindoll. I love Pastor Chuck. He writes some great books. From the book of Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 and 11, it says, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Now, when you are reading, if you choose to read the book of Revelation, when you are reading it, don't trip over, well, what's 10 days? It doesn't make any difference. It really doesn't. It, it, it's, it's one of those things where if God wants you to understand what that means, he'll let you know, but... It's the point is we want to glean what's in here that you can understand. First off, we are going to suffer in life. We all have suffered, and we will all continue to suffer in different ways. Now, in this case, he's literally talking about the devil coming and causing suffering with believers for their faith and for their obedience to do what God's called them to do. So it happens. Stuff happens. Verse 11, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. Here's a second little mysterious thing. The second death? What's the first death? It's the death of this body. Again, like I said earlier, we will all go through that process. We will all walk through that door unless Jesus surprises us with what we have termed the rapture. The word doesn't appear in the Bible, but we being caught up in the air. It, 
unless that happens, we will all walk through death's door, the first death. But the second death is not the death of the body. It's the death of the soul and the spirit. It's eternal separation from God. That's what Jesus paid the price with his blood on the cross to eliminate from our lives. That's the sting that he took the venom away. It's like taking a rattlesnake and removing the venom sack. That thing can bite you, and it doesn't feel good. But it's not going to do anything except for leave a mark. And that's what the devil does in our lives. He leaves marks. We're going to have scars along the way. And when we get to heaven, we'll get to spend eternity comparing scars. It's going to be grand. No believer will ever, ever experience the second death. I got to wrap this up. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I so wish my parents would have drilled that home to me when I was being raised in a household that focused on the end times, you know, on the late great planet Earth and on the the thief in the night kind of movies and, and doctrines and, and, and persuasions, because every time they were just 15 minutes late coming home from work, I knew that I had missed the rapture, they had gone to heaven, and I was damned to hell. It was a rough life. I've had somebody ask me, matter of fact, it was a pastor in my past said, when did you get saved? I said, I don't know. I went to the altar hundreds of times because I was so scared, spitless about going to hell. So every time the pastor would preach a message that brought conviction, I think, well, that's me. I'm going. And it never took or it did take, I just didn't feel it because I was reinforced with this, God's just ready to spew you out of his mouth. Friends, that's not the whole truth. You might find a scripture in the Bible that says that. In the book of Revelation, as a matter of fact, about those who are lukewarm in their faith. But let's focus on the reality. God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the strength of our salvation and the absolutely incredible, unfathomable love of God. Verse 2, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Mm. Everybody say, I'm free. I'm free. It's just that simple. Now, religion will have you walk down this path of rules and regulations, follow this guideline, go through this class, become a member of this cult, I mean, sorry, this congregation, uh, you know, and, and it'll have you walking down and doing checking boxes and doing things on a natural, physical, human level. And the thing is, Jesus did all that needed to be done, and we can do nothing that will help except believe. Now, quit slowing me down. i got to hurry up here. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and 19 go on to say, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. It says we suffer now. So it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It has happened. It will happen. Get over it. Use the, the power of the word to speak it out of your mouth we walk by faith and not by sight of God before me. Who can be against me? For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Now, that glorious day has not come yet, but fear not, it will. Amen? It will. We need to remind ourselves that, especially when we're facing trials, especially when we're facing the oncologist's report, especially when we're facing, you know, the debt collectors and, and the challenges that just happen every day. 
We cannot ever allow ourselves to be victim of circumstance. That's where the devil slips in and slips in the lie that you're just going to have to suffer like everybody else. You are a victim of your circumstance, and he wants us to go into this pity party mode where we don't buck up, polish the armor of God, sharpen the sword of the Spirit, and continue this winning reign that Jesus paid the price for. It is not you and me against the world. It's looking unto Jesus, the beginner, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, looking beyond the suffering, beyond the pain, beyond the cross, saw you and saw me. That was Hebrews 12.2. Hebrews 12.1 says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Those witnesses aren't just Bible people. They're not just people that we can see their names in the Bible, the ones that held off lions, the ones that were swallowed by whales, the ones that caused walls to fall. We're surrounded by witnesses today who are people of faith, and we can use them as an encouragement. One of those people was a black panther. Now, I don't mean a black panther as in the Black Panthers. I mean the silver screen black panther. His name was Chadwick Bozeman. He was not only the Black Panther, but he was a man of faith. Did you know that? Chadwick Bozeman died about three weeks ago at the age of 43. In 2018, he spoke at Howard University as one of the commencement speakers for the graduating class. And these are his words. Sometimes you need to feel the pain and sting of defeat to activate the real passion and purpose that God predestined inside of you. He said that while he was battling late stage colon cancer. Then he went on to say, God says in Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And the skeptics and cynics could say, well, look where that got him. But they can't see where he is. <laughs> Chadwick knew the final score, no matter what cancer had to say in his life. And right to the very end, he was planning to beat it. And right to the very end, he was visiting cancer patients, child cancer patients in the hospital to encourage them. I'm sure to pray for them, to live his life and silently walk out what he was dealt, the life and the hand he was dealt. He walked that out in silence in the public. I'm sure he said a lot in the closet between him and God. But you know what? He's one of those witnesses. And I, I want to close with one last scripture, and that story leads into this, because the question I want to, to end this with is, what should we be doing right now? What should we be doing with our lives? No matter what you're facing, whether you're facing a bad report from the doctor or a bad report from the bill collector or a bad report from the divorce lawyer. What, what should we be doing right now? Jesus said it in Matthew 9, 36 and 38. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the fields. Ask him to use you.
ask him. Just say, God, I can't do much, but I want to do something. The final score is we win. Now tell somebody. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for revealing from, the, from cover to cover in your word that you loved us even when we were unlovely. You died for us even when we were unworthy. And you live today, Jesus, to ever make intercession for us until we meet you in the air. Help us to live our lives in honor of that. In Jesus' name, amen.